Hey everybody, I'm Glenn Hausman. I want to thank you all so much for being here for the latest hot topics brought to you by Hotel Business Magazine and our friends over at Unifocus. I, of course, am Glenn Hausman. You might know me from hosting the No Vacancy podcast or next week on stage where I'll be hosting a general session at the incredible lodging conference in Phoenix, Arizona. But for today, we're going to be talking about an issue that is affecting you folks out there probably most of all. You know what I'm talking about. There's more than 100,000 hotel-specific jobs currently open in the United States, according to the American Hotel and Lodging Association. And since the pandemic, it's been an up and down kind of thing for you folks out there to try to get people working in your hotels. In fact, 80% of hoteliers are saying they are suffering some labor shortages with a good percentage of them saying it is so severe. So what we're going to do today is we want to rethink hospitality's approach to the workforce. We're going to be tackling staffing shortages, those rising costs out there, because labor, labor itself has gone up faster in hospitality than any other sector here in the United States. No more issue is critical than understanding how to manage today's hospitality workforce. In this thought leadership discussion we're going to have today, our experts are going to share with you how hoteliers are streamlining schedules, lowering labor expenses while engaging current and future hospitality professionals, while increasing overall profitability and boosting long-term property value. Again, thanks to our friends over at Unifocus, technology that drives value, and our great panelists today. We've got with us in no particular order, except in the order they were randomly placed on this card in front of me, Jason Reeder. EVP Operations with Remington Hospitality, Justin Jabara, President, Maya Jabara Hotels, Thomas Penny, President of Donahoe Hospitality, John Murray, President, CEO of Senesta International Hotels, and of course, Monish Aurora, CEO of Unifocus. So we're going to be talking up until the top of the hour, and it's important for you all out there to participate. We've already gathered by now. I can talk and talk and talk. But in order to make this really applicable <laughs> to you, I want you to go home with some actionable insights and ask those questions. Plus, this will be available in the October issue of Hotel Business. is a great write-up as well on social media, LinkedIn and Twitter. So it's also going to be available on demand online. So all these juicy nuggets they're going to give you today, yes, they will be juicy. They'll be, you should watch I'll be running it on the No Vacancy podcast feed sometime in October as well. Thanks again to uh, Unifocus. All right, guys, let's get going. Thomas, let me start with you. How are you feeling about labor these days at Donahoe? I'd say I'm feeling better than I was uh, 18 to 24 months ago. But right. It's still the one thing that keeps me up at night. Yeah, I bet it is. There's been a lot of what economists are calling out there is a uh, reallocation friction, right? People trying to figure out maybe a different career path, different jobs. We saw other sectors get more interested in uh, hiring people at higher wages quicker than hospitality responded. And now I think, Jason, people are starting to find their way back to hospitality. What may have seemed great maybe wasn't the best prospect. Are you feeling a little bit of an ease as well, although it's still a critical problem? Yeah, definitely. It's as Thomas said, it's definitely a better situation now than it was in the last, you know, call it year or two years. Mm -hmm. it's, I do find one thing though particularly interesting. It seems like if, when you go to markets that have dynamic general managers, you ever notice that they don't suffer from the same staffing shortages that the other <laughs> hotels do? Now, of course, we all can't have those in every hotel, but right. it just goes to show you that culture piece and the leadership really does matter in terms of retention. Uh yeah. And uh that is the centerpiece for what you folks are doing at Remington Hospitality. You're all about thriving through the culture that you have. John, how are you seeing it being the CEO of a rapidly growing company that needs to make sure they have people to satisfy their customers? Yeah, I mean, our our openings are at the lowest that they've been since the pandemic, but mm -hmm. we have about 12% of our uh, hotel workforce is positions. So it's it remains a, a critical issue, but you know, I think Jason's right. Um, you know, we have a culture of caring at Sunesta, mm -hmm. and I think that, uh, you know, if you have a good GM and you have good team teamwork, um, you know, uh, employees, you know, want to come work with people who are enjoying what they're doing, who are engaged, you know, who, who care about about other people. And so I think that's that's the good thing about hospitality is, is uh, people get into the hospitality business because they care about other people. And so um, 
if you you know if you can get them in the door, I think uh, right. hospitality is contagious for, yeah, for employees as well as uh, guests. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, Justin, get them in the door. I think that's a, a really good point because a lot of other organizations out there in different industries have been getting those people uh, through the door. How are you trying to make your workplace more exciting to deal with uh, some of the shortfalls you might have in employment? And also tell us how you're thinking about um, your levels of staffing in general as well to get started. Yeah, so, so I mean, we're competing as an industry, we're competing against many other industries in our market. So it's no longer just competing against other hotels. And that's one of the things that I think COVID did was it it leveled the playing field. Right. We as an organization have a very strong culture, which is which is appealing. But what we found is is that you you know you can't hire just to be a room attendant. It's the experience of working for Myra Jabara. It's what Myra Jabara has to offer and the experience and the culture of working at that hotel not just cleaning rooms or serving you know serving in the morning right yeah absolutely uh Monish, you know uh, what i like about what you're doing is you're trying to ease the labor burden by really optimizing the human bodies that you have in in there um what are some of the biggest issues that you're seeing in terms of hospitality hiring out there today I think a, a common theme that was just uh, surfaced here is giving managers, uh, frontline managers, especially in GMs, the appropriate amount of time to spend with people right. Right, on the recruiting front, on the retention, just the daily interactions and uh, freeing them up by taking the mundane but necessary tasks around scheduling and automating those and then empowering employees to manage their own time, right? So one thing COVID taught uh, us in, in the industry mm -hmm. is that people want control of their time. Right. They have multiple jobs, you know, they've got priorities, family, and having uh, an op hotel operator, a general manager, give them uh, the time back and their scheduling and being able to spend more face time. To me, that's really where people are differentiating themselves in the market. Jason, what does that mean to you? So, uh, you know, here's how I look at it. I think the advantage we is the reality is our business is fun. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not always fun. There are times when it's tough when you've got, you know, four housekeepers called off and you're, you're, you're sold out. And by the way, you know, the group's checking in early, right? All those situations exist. But, but to me, when, when you think about what we can kind of harness, it's, it really is fun to serve others and the spirit of service and how you do that and how you look at that through that lens, I think attracts a lot of people. So I think, I think the key for us, it, because it, and you're absolutely right during COVID other industries, which is one of the reasons when what you brought up at the beginning, why mm -hmm. the wages have gone up, we had to raise our wages because right. we're honest with ourselves. We were behind the industry average for quite a while we're competing with other industries. So I think the key for us is to keep the culture going. I think another important point we haven't talked about is internally promoting, giving right. people a track that they can go from being that line level attendant to a manager, to a general manager. When you do those types of things, mm -hmm. that's another area that our industry has an advantage of. If you go to another industry, you're going to go work. If you're a dock worker and you're loading a truck, there's a pretty good chance that's your job for the next 20 years. Not in right. hotels. If you're a performer, right. you can go from being you know, that room attendant to eventually a general man. Uh, true. Good point about doing that same job for a lot of years, but uh, I think Archie Bunker had that job. He made a decent <laughs> living. He had a nice house in, in Queens <laughs> over there. Uh, he did. Yeah. John, uh, I mean, that's really a, a really great point he's making. How are you thinking about it in terms of a, of a CEO who has managed properties and franchised properties? Yeah, well, um, we provide all kinds of training content, um, you know, so uh, to Jason's point, so that people can, they get training on the, on the job, mm -hmm. they get training through online classes, yeah. they attend webinars for training, they can do in-person training in, in their corporate office, they get cross-trained for multiple jobs so that, right. so that they can do different things and, and have some variety in, in their life. Um, but then we have... Um, and, and that's available to uh, to our for our managed hotels and, and our franchise hotels. But one of the things that we're doing on the on our managed side that's that's been exciting for us is we we had um, we joined up with uh, AHLA in their Elevate program, mm -hmm. and that's a program where you you know you take a um, a recommended successful hardworking employee that you want to see progress, 
and you team them up with a mentor, somebody else in the hotel or in, a, mm-hmm. in the in the region or a different hotel, and they and they work together and go through a, a whole training to to get them prepared to take on their next role, and it's really exciting to see um, how well people react to seeing that their fellow employees want to mentor them to, so that they can do better in the, in in the hospitality industry. And, yep. and we've had a number of the people who've gone through, we had 30 pairs of people do it uh, in, last year. And, and this this year we have 60 pairs. And so we've, we've doubled the number. And uh, a number of the mentors mm-hmm. were the, were in being mentored last year. And so it, that's that's how it, it, it is. Um, it really caught on much more uh, interest in it than we, than we expected. Uh, but it's really helping with the engagement of our employees. That's pretty cool because I would think if I'm coming into something and now all of a sudden I've got someone teaching me and mentoring me and I learned that they were they were in my position a year ago, I think that would make me very excited for the potential I have if I stick around for this job. Um, incidentally, a little factoid, um, wages for hoteliers out there on an hourly basis are at an all-time high of more than $23 per hour. Currently, according to the AHLA, of course, in places like New York City and other big cities, it'll be higher. And in some places, it might be lower, but not necessarily so much in some smaller towns where on no vacancy, we talk to a lot of owners and operators that say sometimes the employment pool is so small, they really have to pay even more at some of those hotels. So that engagement issue and that growth issue is really, really important. So Thomas, we were talking, you know, a little bit about that particular program. How are you thinking in your organization about accelerating the growth uh, with people within your company at Donahoe? So we uh, have partnered with an organization called Build Within. They have a technology platform uh, where they basically have pathways for every uh, discipline within a hotel such that employees can take advantage of online training and it will actually notify their supervisor when they've completed the modules and will let us know when they're ready for the next job based on the training that they've completed. Mm -hmm. And so instead of managers having to go around and engage people's interests, now we're, we're basically empowering our team members to show us that they're committed to to learning by taking advantage of this online training, and uh, and we're excited about it right now. Marriott at the uh, at the global level is is looking at it to see if they can put it in place. Mm-hmm. But it's about using technology to basically allow for our team members to take advantage of training, and then efficiently, you know, moving them along. The beauty of of this moment in time, we have more opportunities. We have, uh, you know. Uh, we have more vacancies than at any point in my 31 years in the business. And so there's opportunities for folks at every level, and we're trying to uh, expedite and accelerate their ability to access them. Uh, yeah, and um, companies like Remington, for example, have not only been promoting people from within, but uh, you've been expanding, so you've been adding new areas for people to take on uh, opportunities, right? So, But Justin, I want to ask you what you're thinking about that in creating those pathways forward so people understand this is not a job. This is a real legitimate career, and I'm going to have a satisfactory life. Yeah. I mean, within our journey culture, we have something that's called the learning plan. And for for all levels of leadership within the organization, Mm -hmm. uh, you're required to have a learning plan. And it's very simple the way the learning plans are are laid out. It's it's what do I need to to know to do my current job or current role better, um, my future role, and then my dream role. And, And we look at ourselves, you know, within the organization and say, if you're a front desk supervisor, with us and a year later, you're still only a front desk supervisor and you don't know more or you're not capable of more mm-hmm. and you want to be a director, you know, sales manager, whatever the role may be, we have failed you uh, within our organization. So that that learning plan and those those periodical check-ins and, and the investment within within the associates is critical to the success of our organization. Wow, I like what you say, how you're taking responsibility. We failed you, the employee. I feel like my whole time of growing up, it was all about what I could do for them. And it was never, it was never a give and take, a positive feedback loop at all. 
So I think by just switching that whole notion to it being about them probably sets the stage for that culture that you want to create. And Jason, I want to ask you about uh, creating the right type of culture, but first I want to or ask all of you out there, ask your questions. What are the issues that you're dealing with and how can our expert panelists help you be more successful? So Jason, what's the trick to actually creating that culture to help people thrive to go back to your theme of the conference last year? Yeah, so, you know, you know, a common thing that Sloan will say is culture doesn't happen to you, if it runs through you, right? right. And so I think part of culture is that everyone gets engaged in it. And it starts with the people that you hire. You know, our, our big slogan is we're the place where passionate people thrive, right? So we mm -hmm. look for those passionate type people who love the industry, who really want to move up and do more. I mean, one quick example, uh, Hampton Inn and Buford, just outside of Atlanta, we have a general manager named Yanti. She was a breakfast attendant three years ago. Oh. And she worked worked her way up. What? And now she's a general manager of this Hampton Inn. But that's part of where you have to. I think that's all those amazing. Yeah, all those programs that we're talking about are important. But what's equally as important is having the person who's making those decisions be open and acceptable to take risks at time on employees. Because let's be honest, there was always a job out there at one point that we weren't qualified for. Someone took a chance on us, right? So when Yanti was applying for the GM, I can promise you we had other applicants that had GM experience. So mm -hmm. I think part of the culture has to be taking that risk per se, but knowing that you have to at times look from within because if you provide the programs, but at the end of the day, still hire from the outside routinely, yeah. eventually you get bottlenecked and it doesn't work. Thomas, he's making a great point there, right? Without question. I mean, uh, people want the opportunity for growth, especially uh, th this generation of millennials and Gen Zers. They don't want to wait 20 years to become a general manager. And so we got to give them an accelerated track. And, mm -hmm. and in the story that Jason referenced, that's going to spread throughout the organization. They're going to hear that story and folks are going to want to work in the organization because they see the potential for that kind of growth. And, and so I think we have tremendous stories within all of our organizations around how, you know, our industry is a low floor, high ceiling business. Folks have started at the bottom and worked their way up the top. I think at a time when college uh, tuition is rising and, and is unaffordable for a large percentage of Americans, our industry is, is the industry where they can come in and, and really make a great living um, and, and grow within our within our business. And so I think that's what we got to continue to do is to make certain that uh, folks uh, are, are connected to these stories. John, how are you connecting the uh, the stories within your organization between all the different brands that you have? Yeah, I mean, I think it goes back to uh, what Jason said. You know, if you, if you identify passionate people, um, I mean, I, I told a story to, to at another uh, conference recently that my wife and I were traveling in Chicago and the, um, um, it was a Saturday morning. I had shorts and a t-shirt and I had a baseball cap on. So I was kind of like the, uh, you know, undercover uh, boss. And, uh, that's uh, that's my uh, uniform here at the, uh, at the office, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> and the, um, we were having breakfast and, and the waiter came up, went over to it. There was a couple sitting at a high top and he went over and he said, he gave them, they'd paid the bill. He, he was just uh, returning the credit card. He just, you know, processed the payment. And he said, so what are you guys up to today? And they said, uh, oh, it's, you know, we're going to go up to the room and kind of look through some brochures and kind of figure it out. And then for 10 minutes, thankfully, it wasn't a busy restaurant. Right. He <laughs> said, you know what? <clears throat> he said, you know, the little known thing, Chicago Zoo is one of the best zoos in the country. And if you're into the LGBTQ thing, there's a fair this weekend out in this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you take the M3 bus and then there's a sailing thing going on down at the Navy Yard. You can go do that. And he just like ran through. I, I looked at my wife and I said, this guy should be our concierge. And so, you know, I complimented him on afterwards when he came over to wait on us. And, you know, he just said, listen, I've lived in Chicago all my life. I love this city. And I feel it's my responsibility when we have guests in this hotel to tell them about all the different things that they can experience here. And so that's that's just that's just him. And so you try to find people like that, and and uh, you know then that that's that's a uh, an experience. You know people talk about experiences all the time, but that's an experience. That couple right. 
is going to remember for a long time and, and and things that they'll remember about Chicago for a long time. Right. You're absolutely correct. Cause I was joking around and I, I, you know, I said it to uh, Monish uh, and his crew the other day. It's like, nobody comes back from a hotel saying, wow, that lamp was gorgeous. You guys got to stay here because of it. It always directly connects to the human beings that facilitate the experience set against an amazing hospitality uh, backdrop. Manish, uh, before we go on to, I'm starting to get some great questions from the audience over here, but before we get into to that, you're managing an international workforce. How do you think about appealing to people that have different cultural values and stuff and making everybody feel like they have a seat of the table and they could be successful in the company, no matter the background? I think you touched on uh, a couple comments here in that, uh, we do a great job in the industry asking our guests how they're doing, what they need. And we've got great stories of employees engaging them. Uh, I think driving consistency around uh, surveying our workforce and, and doing it regularly and publishing that information saying, here's what you're telling us. And you're going to hear different things in different parts of the country uh, and around the world. And being able to share that across the organization, having transparency, and uh, being very clear about, you know, we have an engagement goal or we have an inclusion goal. And those types of things uh, really unite people around uh, around the world, around various brands, and, and it will hold you accountable to your values, right? Mm -hmm. And so you'll, people will tell you, are you living up to your values? Uh, and, and that to me is how you bring everything together that we're, what I'm hearing around culture and uh, making sure we're doing it internally because those people are, are are brands externally. We do a great job managing external. We need to match that internally. John, you're not in your head. It's very powerful when you do when Yeah, you do I got to hear what you have to say. Sorry, go on. Sure. It's very powerful when you do an engagement survey like like Manish was uh, talking about. And then you do the next one and you and you tell, you know, you get the results and you tell them, we heard you say you wanted better communications and now we do these meetings we publish this uh newsletter you know that we we heard you and we took action that's it's very powerful and it's important to publish a critical feedback too so people know that you're not afraid of uh the things that are ugly or <laughs> you need to improve upon and you're owning up to it because otherwise you lose credibility so by by saying the good things and also recognizing the weaknesses people start to then believe and belief is something that's really powerful. Justin, are you doing something similar to that? And do you believe that the people are being fundamentally honest or do they still keep things close to the vest that you got to kind of figure out? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I mean, fundamentally, when, when you think about our organization, we're in the hotel business, but we're really in the people business, right? I mean, it's our role to have good position assets in the right markets that, that are maintained well. But then they, we're in the people business. I think a great way of, of gauging that is associate surveys. And we, we monitor a handful of, of KPIs regularly uh, throughout our organization. And AOS scores, associate scores, are one of the, the large indicators that we look at to, to gauge a healthy organization all the way down to you know, throughout the organization. Yeah, excellent. Uh, or so uh, Amanda's got a great question over here. She says she loves Jason's comment on taking a risk. But what about doing that with underutilized groups like the disabled, for example? Do you think general managers have enough support to do that? And uh, there's a number of organizations that are very focused on trying to get those kinds of individuals into the hotel. Um, Jason, you want to go? And then maybe uh, Thomas will have him follow up. Yeah, sure. No, listen, we th th that's important for all of us. I think mm -hmm. one thing we always miss is that our associates should match our guests. And so, you know, it should be where there's an interrelation there. And, and I will tell you, there's a lot of programs. We do have programs where we work to make sure we're hiring disabled, military. It's important to offer opportunities for all. And I think there's a, the ability to do that. And a lot of it has to do with the job and feeling flexible. That's, the, that's another thing we haven't touched on yet, but one of the ways we've tackled some of these shortages is the traditional shifts, so to speak. Mm -hmm. We've yep. become much more flexible with when people can work and what hours and what days. And so I think a key to that is just really being accepting, but also just, you know, 
challenging the status quo, but it doesn't have to be, you know, you don't always have to work seven to three at the desk shift, right? You could also maybe work 11 to six. That right. also works, right? So I think it's just having that ability to be flexible. And that's why that's where uh, Manisha's uh, help comes in, in being able to help you create that sort of thing for your employees. Thomas, what do you think about this issue? Uh, you know, here at Donahoe for the past 25 years, this has been something that we've been passionate about, uh, hiring folks from, with differing abilities. This past summer, we took a, an apprentice, a, a young man who was in a wheelchair who worked for us in our laundry department. Mm -hmm. As I was touring through the hotel, I had a chance to meet him. His name was Jameer. And in a few seconds, he looked me in my eye, held my hand and said that uh, he wanted to be in the hospitality business. He wanted to work for us. And he asked me what was his future. Right. Well, at the end of the apprentice uh, uh, program, we, we, there was an event um, kind of acknowledging this youth-based program throughout the city. And we, we made him an offer at this closing program. Well, this is a young man who every day he came to work, he was in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. But when we offered him the job, he actually mustered the will to get out of the wheelchair, to walk to the stage, to accept the offer. And, and, and he became emotional talking about what the job would mean for him and his right. ability to help his mother. And so this is really, really important. Jameer came to work not only on time, but came to work early. And he was working about 10 miles away from where he lived. And he had to catch public transportation yeah. for the first time in order to get to work. And just a phenomenal young man. And I think it's extremely important that we uh, that we create opportunities for folks to transition in our business, folks with differing abilities. Uh, yeah. Uh, anyone else want to comment on that particular issue? All right. Um, John, you're good. I, I, I just uh, I, I echo what the other the other guys said, you know, we had a uh, employer of the year uh, award winner last year um, at the uh, Alice conference uh, who was uh, um, she's deaf and mute, uh, but she manages the laundry department in our Chattanooga hotel. Wow. And she's worked there for 20 years and she had never left Tennessee and she was so excited to go uh, to LA and win this. I award. bet. And, um, but um, she did, she comes to work every day smile on a face works a you know a full shift and then some covers for other employees just uh, you know fabulous employees so um you know it, when you when you take that risk like jason said um you know it, it engenders um good feelings from the employee they work they work even harder for you because you you've uh, taken a chance and invested in them. right and yeah, i'll be I, honest just yeah go, oh, sorry go Glenn. On. I was go say, on, just on. One, more, one more comment. When you when you do take that risk, most employees know that you took that risk. And so to the point about being motivated, and I, I, we find that most people, when you've taken the risk on someone, want to prove that you made the right decision, which is all the more reason to be yeah. motivated. And I'll just add, you know, we, we have a vice president of, of, of analytics who works mm -hmm. for our company who also can't hear. He's hearing impaired. And we've made yes. accommodations when we we're on his name is Zach. You probably know him, but we were. Uh, he's been on No calls. Vacancy Live before, yeah. and so, it, it was great. We, yeah, he just we just put closed captioning on when we're doing uh, different calls. So it's like, mm -hmm. and he is incredibly intelligent, incredibly smart, and so I, I think a, a lot of people have a lot of gifts to offer, and so I think it's important, as everyone else has said, it's just you know. Right. Excellent. Now, uh, we uh, I got a question from uh, Birch, and we'll get to that in a second. But Leonard is asking, what are good ways to go about recruiting? these underutilized groups? I think that's a really uh, important answer. Anyone have a, a, an answer to that mystery? So for Jason, us, uh, for Thomas, for, go for it. Yeah, for us, we, we've we worked with the Bridges Marriott Foundation. Yeah, they, they have a presence in a lot of major urban markets uh, where they're servicing young people. Right. And they've been a good source for us uh, across multiple markets for a long time. Excellent. Yeah, we, we partner with organizations in the community um, that, that typically help with that. Also, one mm -hmm. of our best things are employee referrals themselves. So people that are already working there that know someone, a cousin, a friend. Uh, a lot of times, some of our best recruitment is from referrals from existing employees. Uh, yeah, and if you, if you get someone from one specific community, then they're going to share it with all of their friends exactly. and family and create that kind of uh, going viral 
thing in your neighborhood <laughs> for, for hiring. All right, so um, uh, Birchin is uh, asking, in light of the current talent gap and changing perceptions about our industry, what proactive measures such as PR strategies and other initiatives are you currently implementing or contemplating to effectively communicate the value and appeal of hospitality careers to younger uh, generations? Uh, who would like to go for uh, for that one? So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, on, the, on the board of NAF, which is a uh -huh. national board that helps with uh, preparing young people for college and careers. Today, we have 18,000 uh, young people across many major urban centers uh, participating in academies of hospitality and tourism. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're doing everything we can across these markets to make sure they meet folks like me who started washing dishes in the business 31 years ago. Yep. And, and, and get connected to these stories such that they would they will have an interest in the business. Now, Anthony, uh, your partner, Glenn, yep. on the Vacancy Live, you know, he did a good job with his show of, of really telling the story about the industry. Yep. Um, all of these chef story uh, shows have helped. And, uh, and I'm just excited that we have, you know, so many young people now pursuing a career in our industry. And again, we try to push out on social media many of the success stories that I talked about previously. In fact, uh, you know, not to promote Anthony uh, too much, I love him to death, but uh, he is actually so passionate about this issue. He tells me the only legacy he really wants to have is getting people to come into the hospitality industry and showing them a path to success. In fact, he's got a new uh, program that he's uh, working on called Hospitality All-Stars, where it shows how cool it is to work in the hotel and three people compete for an actual job in a hotel it's a lot of fun i'm looking forward to seeing that get off the ground but it's creative things like that that i think help get that message out so justin how are you really appealing to that next generation of people and what are you doing then to get them in the doors and to keep them it's, it's all about the experience of every everything that we're talking about is, is not about the, mm -hmm. the role or the job yeah. that we had or that we fill within hospitality it's the experience of working within hospitality and being with the guests and working with each other. Uh, I spend spend more time with the people in our company and in, in our office uh, than I do my own family. And in, in many hotels, uh, mm -hmm. that is the same case. And so, so we, you know, we're we're telling the story of what it is to be in hospitality uh, and sharing that. And and rather than you know what it's like to to be a, a engineer per se. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a, that makes a whole lot of sense to me as as, as well. Um, so Birchin is also asking with the rapid advancements in AI tools and plugins and robotics, how do you foresee the integration of these technologies impacting hotel operations in the near future? Just came off air doing a show on this exact topic. And uh, Monish and I were talking about it earlier this week as well. To me, the way I see it. It's all about replacing jobs behind the scenes that you didn't necessarily come in contact with with people. John, as the CEO of a major organization, how are you thinking about the path forward for all of your different hotels within the different categories to relieve some of that burden by putting in smart technologies? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that's kind of exciting for, for us that we're experimenting with is uh, um, uh, ro robots to help with um, uh, room service. Mm -hmm. So, um, so if somebody gets yep. call, calls down to the restaurant, they give their cell, cell phone number, their room number, place their order. The the uh, when the meal is ready, it's or if it gets delivered from a you know from an outside service, they put it inside this robot that has like a cooler built into it, and it it drives over to the elevator, has yep. communicates with the elevator. The door is open. It goes up to the floor, goes down the hallway to the to the guest room, calls the person's cell phone number and says, hey, it's Sonny, the uh, robot outside your door. Come on out and grab your uh, grab your meal or grab your towels, whatever yeah. it was that the guest requested. So that, that's that's a pretty cool use of technology that that helps uh, fill a role that 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 we're having trouble filling. We're, we're experimenting right. with it at uh, Miami Airport. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so it, it, it helps us. Uh, fill a challenging role, uh, but the guests love it. Yeah, so. uh, it's it's fun, 
And not only that, um, but when it comes to things like room service or getting towels delivered, that's kind of a scenario where the guest doesn't necessarily want to have a human interaction anyway. So you're enhancing their customer experience while lowering the overall expense of operations. And I think that's where the real opportunity uh, lies for people. Monish, your whole business is based on, you know, saving uh, those those dollars for, for hoteliers out there. So how are you thinking about this issue as far as Unifocus goes and beyond? What we're hearing from our clients is that they want to maximize that guest interaction, that mm -hmm. uh, team member to team member interaction. So for me, you know, AI, the best use in our industry is freeing up those front of house, uh, you know, frontline uh, employees that are engaging with guests. So the things that they would be doing in the background that can be replaced with AI or enhanced mm -hmm. or even the quality improved, that's the best application for AI. I, I personally am not uh, one that sees AI replacing people in a, you know, face-to-face -face, uh, hospitality business, right. unless that is the business model where you've got a, a, a property which is designed around that experience, and that's the expectation of the guest. Mm -hmm. right? So where I see it being used uh, effectively is you're freeing up time. It creates a better guest experience. Employees feel empowered. They feel like they're doing something that's value-added, and I think that's where you're going to have the greatest adoption. Yeah, Thomas? Uh, I think Monish hit, hit the nail on the head. Uh, it's to basically allow for us to deliver uh, an even better guest experience. And, uh, you know, technology is just to, to, to complement the guest experience, not to replace people. We'll always be in the people business. That is absolutely right. And I <laughs> say this all the time because we need to be sure that we don't remove that human element from hospitality. Because as Justin said, we are in the people business. And once we lose that, we'll become a commoditized product and it won't matter because the guests will be able to just go anywhere. There won't be any differentiation, right? So going forward, that's a really, really serious issue. Now, the other issue that we kind of uh, would talked about is bringing new entrants to the table, getting out to different communities and being people, bringing people in such as the disabled. But there's also a lot of amazing DEI initiatives that are out there making sure that all voices are represented in our incredible industry. For example, IHG is wanting to make sure that they double the amount of, you know, women in the boardroom and create gender equity. And they're doing other elements like that. There's no, no surprise that Hilton's been named the number one and number two uh, best company to work for because of their interest in engaging employees and making sure that they're taken care of if they have a, uh, issues in their lives as a sick parent, a sick child, even a sick pet, they'll make sure that you could uh, take care of those particular issues. Thomas, I know we've talked about this issue before. It's near and dear to your heart. How are you making sure that you bring people to the table that weren't there before and letting them know, hey, we got this great big table here for you as well? So I, I learned something about this uh, from listening to my daughter many years ago. She was 13 mm -hmm. years old. I gave her a hospitality company to do some research on. Mm -hmm. And she came back to me and she said, Dad, I don't want to work for this company. I said, what are you mm -hmm. talking about? They have great hotels. They have uh, you know great experiences they create. She said, Dad, I went to the senior leadership page and I didn't see any women. I didn't see anybody who looked like me. So why would I want to work for this company? Right. And so- right. There's intentionality within our organization if, such that uh, if you look at our senior leadership page, we want everybody to see uh, see a pathway for themselves. Mm -hmm. And so we're intentional about making certain that we hire folks at the highest levels of our organization that shares those values. And then we're incentivizing our senior leaders to, to consider DEI as right. they're making hiring decisions. And, and the thing that I'm proud of uh, here uh, that I've been working on the last three years is, is the Marriott Sorensen Center at Howard University, creating a, a, a world-class program for graduates of power to uh, to get on an accelerated track in the senior leader, leadership uh, positions within our business. Not only that, Thomas, but as you very well know, Ashley Johnson over there, the executive director, is not just focused on people within hospitality, but reaching out to all areas and disciplines within the school to say, hey, 
you could do that in our business and have an amazing career while you're at it. Thomas, I know you've done a great job in your company at making sure everybody's represented in senior levels. But when we come from a culture that it was one particular group of people that got all of the advantages and may have decades ahead of experience and other people. So how do you make sure that individuals that did not have the opportunity to grow really get to grow and then could achieve that level and getting to the top positions in a shorter period of time? Because they don't want to wait, you know, those two decades to get to the top of the, the leadership page, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I think for us, having senior leaders who started at the lowest level, levels of diverse background, sharing their stories with our team members, that's the most powerful way to let folks understand what is possible. Yeah. It's one thing for someone to talk about it, but it's it's another thing for, for someone of a shared background to talk about it. Yep. I think that makes it meaningful. And so uh, that's what we do. We try to empower senior leaders and, and really uh, let them know that the expectation is they're going to go into hotels, they're going to talk to our people, share their personal experiences of being in our business, traveling the world without leaving the workplace, and they're going to inspire team members to reach higher and to stay with us. That's great. John, I know that um, you probably, I think you guys have been working on this particular issue very diligently over the last uh, six, eight months. I think I'm correct about that. If so, could you tell me a little bit more? Uh on the diversity side, we, yes, we, we've been focused on it. Um, I think really since since day one. But you know, we're we're really proud that uh, forty plus percent of our uh, senior leaders are women. Uh, almost three quarters of our employees are uh, non-white people. Awesome. Um, we um, you know we we have we volunteer on on uh, at. Uh, of Boston University on different uh, committees with the dean of the hotel school, um, trying trying to attract uh, young um, students to to the business um, and and university settings is is a great place to get a diverse pool of candidates. Um, you know, not not necessarily just whether it's male or female or or people of color or not, but you get you get people from different countries, and that. That that creates, um, you know, just di different different environments and different cultures that they come come from, imbued into the, the culture of the hotels and where they work. So that's we're always thinking about that. Uh, that and what I really love about bringing a, you know a lot of different groups in to have a voice is you don't get the same thing, right? When like I'm sure. When um, I'm up at my brother-in-law's house for Rosh Hashanah this weekend, there's going to be a lot of similar talk and point of view, right? But if I could bring in a lot of different people, then we'll have a much more interesting, robust conversation that'll probably be healthier for all of us in in the long run. Justin, I want to go. I want to go to you and and talk a little bit about at what point because so many jobs have been open for so long at what point do you just say we're going to eliminate this job and how are you thinking about maybe just changing around the operational model in order to be successful and do more with fewer people well you know i think covid was a it was a curse for sure uh, but it was a blessing in the fact that it, it required us to rethink our operations and so there were a lot of lessons and there were hard lessons learned uh, during COVID that uh, I think we need to, to hold on to. When we look at our operational models, at that time, we thought, you know, they were as efficient as they needed to be. Uh, coming out of COVID, you know, somehow we got there and we got more efficient. And mm -hmm. so when we look at uh, a lot of the, you know, some of the services, such as daily housekeeping, right? Is, is it needed? Uh, room service, uh, van service, the list goes on. You know what what is critical to the to the operation and the experience? Uh, and, and in today's environment with costs going up, uh, we we need to be more stringent in our operations and our operational model. So so one of the things that I would say is let's not forget the lessons that COVID taught us. Yeah, Jason. No, I agree with that. I think there's a balance between keeping the efficiencies, efficiencies that we learned during COVID, but still providing the guest service that the guest expects. Because if we remember back in COVID times, it wasn't really about guest service, right? We were just kind of covering the best we could. 
So I think there is a balance that takes place there. Um, but I would say, you know, I think the biggest thing, I'll go back to the same thing. I think the biggest thing is getting the right leader in the hotel, mm -hmm. making sure you're promoting from within and hiring. And, and, and again, we all have those hotels. Think about those hotels. Those are the ones who are not challenged for recruitment because they've created a culture and environment in that hotel where everyone goes. Going back to, you know, the Yanti story, she's a female Pacific Islander. You don't mm -hmm. think there's other minorities in that hotel that think they have a shot because she went from breakfast attendant to GM, right? So those yep. are the types of things when you do that. And by the way, Glenn, that also makes up with the part when you were talking about how do you make up for that gap in experience? Right. Well, you take a risk, you take a chance, and you promote from within, that gives them a chance to get up there. So I think it's the balance between, this is Justin said, you got to remember the efficiencies. Those forward-facing guest experiences are really important. You, you, I think you opened with this line. You don't remember the land. You remember mm -hmm. the people. I right. can promise you the guests that stayed at John's Hotel are, are talking about the restaurant server who came over and talked about the experiences. Yeah. They weren't talking about the eggs. I get it. I'm disgusting. That's what they're going to remember. But right, because that is what humanity is about. And that's what hospitality is about. Those close connections that really bond us to the experience that we're, we're having over there. John, what is it do you think that the typical employee wants most beyond elevation of their career in, in the day to day? You know, I, I think that they um, they want to feel valued. They they want to feel um, you know that they're part part of something bigger than just just themselves. And and so um, you know, having that camaraderie with with their with their teammates. Um, seeing their teammates invest and helping them progress to the next level. Um, but, you know, those getting recognition for a job well done. Um, I, th I think those are the things that, uh, that, that people really value uh, as employees, uh, knowing that, 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 you know, that they're being heard when they, when they, you know, when they respond to a, yeah. um, you know, a, uh, you know, an engagement survey, if they say, you know, this, this bothers me, or I find this to be a challenge, and then then you you, you know you you own it and and fix it. I, those those sorts of things really resonate with employees. Yeah, uh, Thomas, what about you? What are you seeing that employees are really looking for more than anything? And how do you recognize them and make them feel special? I once heard that uh, you know someone could survive off a compliment for three days. I don't remember where that quote came from, or if I'm getting accurate, but I think the sentiment is is there. So I think John, you know, he said it best when he said employees want to feel valued. They also want to be connected to a, a, a bigger purpose mm -hmm. uh, with everything that's happening uh, around the country. Uh, we've seen more employees than ever want to, to, to be involved in volunteer activities and they want to make a difference within the communities of which they, they work in. And so to the extent that we value our team members, we promote our team members, and we allow for them to do good and do well while at work, I think that that's that's the secret sauce. So they could go out and participate in something that's not specifically work-related, but is beneficial to the community. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think, uh, you know, folks want to be a part of some some purpose and to the extent that we can create that at work uh, what we've seen within our organization is employees have responded favorably and wanted really to be involved with that's a wonderful word purpose i think that's really what drives us as human beings and if we can connect with that core need uh we'll we'll achieve happiness and People will feel secure and want to stay in their jobs. Jason, what do you think about purpose? No, I think that's the reason we do what we do, right? And I think, you know, that, that going back to what you said, value, respect, and appreciate. I think those are the three key things that employees want where they're there. But purpose is what you think about purpose-driven life. You think about what drives you, what motivates you. That's that's the key. I mean, that's the that's the secret sauce. Yeah, for, for, for sure. Um, Justin, any ideas that you have out there that you find successful? Well, I mean, it's all, all of those aspects. And when, when you think of, of our hotels, I mean, they're, they're across the United States and they're in communities all across the United States. Mm -hmm. We always say that our properties are, are where we host the community, right? Mm -hmm. And if you look at the hotel 
um, it, it can provide livelihoods to, to many, many families. And that paycheck goes way beyond the individual receiving uh, that paycheck and, and affects many, many lives. So, so we look at the role of a general manager and the role of, of the, the leadership at a hotel. It's really how do we drive good within the community, host the community, and then the community will will you know come stay at our, our property and 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 support us. So it's it would, you know it's a vital role that we feel that we play uh, being in the hospitality industry. Uh, yeah, and one really cool thing that I've seen is uh, the DoubleTree in Reading, Pennsylvania. They've really focused on community. And really the whole purpose um, behind the hotel and uh, general manager and uh, part owner Craig Poole's purpose there is to reinvigorate the community. Uh, everything they do is about reinvigorating the community and giving people within the community a chance of success. Uh, we were talking about working with uh, some disenfranchised groups before, such as the uh, disabled he, Craig Poole, works with a lot of people who have had run-ins with the law that have maybe done time in prison, understanding that it's a cause of poverty that causes people to go that way. It's not necessarily an indication of who you are as a human being. So he's had great, great success with programs like that. Thomas, you're nodding a lot. I feel you got to make a comment. Yeah, I mean, uh, this, this population really wants to work at a time when we need people that want to work. And uh, mm -hmm. we've had great success in bringing folks in, particularly those with nonviolent offenses, bringing them into our business. They're grateful for the opportunity. We see the energy that they bring to work every day. Um, they also are accustomed to dealing with uh, different challenges and, and working through challenges. And so they've been a real asset to us. And uh, and they've they've uh, we've hired more in recent years, and uh, they're a part of our recruitment strategy. Monish, you seeing anything uh, real smart that hoteliers are doing with the properties you work with? I, I think we're hearing some great examples here today, uh, and it's taking these stories right and uh, really sharing this uh, across the organization, right? So a, a story in Memphis is really powerful in Memphis, but it could be as powerful in Atlanta or Detroit. And so figuring out a platform, uh, and this is not me doing a technology pitch, but our population is using their mobile devices for everything, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you are not utilizing those mobile devices today to communicate with employees, whether it's you know the simplest thing from, hey, here's a change to your shift, to we we need an you know we need someone to help with this uh, activity uh, to recognition, right? Uh, doing that not locally but broadly, that to me is uh, not a game changer. Those are table stakes, and so right. uh, you know it's very powerful that we engage people. Not that we got to get all, all get on TikTok and tell our story for our, uh, our property, but we've got to be where our employees are and where our future employees are. And that's where I see the differentiate. That's where we're lagging as an industry. Great points. Uh, Justin, one way to make sure that employees are getting paid more without going out of your pocket uh, is through uh, tipping. How are you seeing the e-tipping e thing emerge in your business? Yeah, I think the, the technology when it first came out had a ways to go. Uh, we've beta test multiple platforms uh, we're in final testing of uh, two in particular, uh, but I see this as the future. I mean, it just when you when you walk mm -hmm. around, that we used to carry money, and now it's all digital. Right. It's Apple Pay and everything yep. else. So, so why should tipping be any different? Uh, that is absolutely correct. And anecdotally speaking, um, in an unofficial poll of doormen at hotels in New York City their average rate of tipping has dropped precipitously from something like $400 a day to like $100 a day, just because there's a lot of people coming in and out going, oh, oh, sorry, I don't have any cash on me. So if we could figure out a way to get those people tipped through e-tipping, I think that they'll be very successful. We're almost out of time. So I'd love to get everybody's uh, final thoughts. Monish, let's start with you. Yeah, I'll simply say, you know, an empowered workforce is uh, an engaged workforce is going to drive great guest experience. And so to the extent that, you know, there's some great ideas that came out 
here today. Um, it's it's about elevating and and promoting those ideas so that uh, it's not just happening in one property, but uh, across uh, a hotelier's portfolio. So technology is yeah. one way to do that. Yep, Jason. Yeah, I would just say that you know overall, I think we we're in a unique situation with our business. We have the opportunity to extend service and be hospitable to people. And I'm not trying to sound too, che too cheesy here, but we really can make the world a better place. I mean, mm -hmm. when you have people that come in, they're coming in for all kinds of reasons. Maybe someone in their family just died, or mm -hmm. you know, maybe they just had a job loss, or they're going through a divorce, whatever. Life happens throughout, right? But our ability to change the course of that person's direction and attitude directly by our team members is a very empowering and engaging thing. So I just think never forget the people. The people are what make it happen, and it's just an incredible business to be in. Oh, I love that. Thomas, how about you, sir? I'll just co-tell Jason's comments by saying, you know, our hotels have people represented from all over the world. And at a time where there's a bit of chaos in, our, in the country right now, uh, we have communities that exist among our associates in our hotels. And, and I just think it's a powerful thing. I think folks want to be connected to communities. We have them within our hotels. And so uh, it's an exciting time to be in the business. It's an exciting time to welcome in the next generation of hospitality mm -hmm. professionals. It's an exciting time to integrate technology. Um, you know, I've never been more excited about the future of our business than I am right now. That is a uh, fantastic. And one way to get people at the property level excited is to have that sense of community and young people really crave that. I'm older now. I don't need to have those interpersonal relationships within a workplace. But when I was in my 20s, that was everything. And anything you could do to communicate that value proposition that you will be get into a community of people that then you could have fun with and build a life alongside of, I think that'll be very successful. Justin, what about your final thoughts, sir? We're in the hotel business, but we're really in the people business. And, and yeah. so the better the people, the better the business. You got it. John, how about you? Yeah, we, I mean, we just came out with a new video to put on our hiring website. And, mm -hmm. and it's, it's called We're People People. And I think, uh, you know, if you remember that, um, it's, I think, to Justin and, and others' points, it's, you know, it's, it's hospitality, but it's people. It's, it's people helping people. Um, and, and so I think if, if you remember that, if we're people, people, um, yep. the rest falls into place. It sure does. I uh, remember what they said at Ritz Carlton, ladies and gentlemen, serving ladies and gentlemen. And I really think that's the quintessential experience. We want to make sure that all of our associates have within the hospitality workplace. So what we learned today, staff engagement is absolutely essential. People are looking for more than just a job. They want to feel value. They want to have flexibility. They want to be able to have control over their lives while being given a path of success to the future. Plus, it's absolutely critical for us to bring in more stakeholders than ever before from different backgrounds, different communities, different disabilities or not. Um, and that is absolutely critical to the future of our success. I want to thank everyone for being here today. Moniz, Justin, Thomas, Jason, and John. And be sure to read the article in October's issue of Hotel Business Magazine and watch this on replay. There was so much good information here. You're going to have to check it out again and again and download this version of the podcast at No Vacancy Live. Thank you so much, all. We'll see you next time right back here on another Hotel Business Hot Topic. See you later. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you. Later, guys. Good Good night. Night. Take care.